there's blood on the wall here, there's blood on the wall here, and there was blood right here. Was there any blood on the TV, do you remember? Yeah, there was blood on the TV. Okay. There was blood on the chairs. There was blood on this chair. There was blood on the table. There was blood on the Hobby Lobby bag that was sitting there. Okay. Thanksgiving is a time for family and friends to gather, thankful for everything they have been given, sharing in the bounty of the season. So how did that wonderful holiday tie in to the disappearance of a young mother and the eventual discovery of her brutal murder? Join us as we look into the horrifying case of Kelsey Barreth. Before we begin, we would like to extend our deepest sympathies to the family and friends of Kelsey Barreth. Twenty-nine-year-old Kelsey Barreth was making her way in life, establishing her career as a flight instructor and raising her one-year-old daughter, Kaylee, in a picturesque area called Woodland Park, Colorado. She had a relationship with a handsome young rancher she had met through a dating website. The two built a relationship that reflected the mountains in which they lived, rocky but filled with promise if you worked hard to make it a home together. Kelsey grew up on a farm in Washington State and pursued her passion of flying, becoming a licensed pilot and eventually a flight instructor for DOS Aviation in Pueblo, Colorado. Her small town home at 269 East Lake Avenue in Woodland Park was a great starting point for a single mom. Quiet and in a nice community, the home was just an hour commute to the office and a 20-minute drive to little Kaylee's father's ranch near Florissant, Colorado. That pleasant story began to play out differently, though, on December the 2nd, 2018, when local police knocked on Kelsey's door for a welfare check on the young woman. Kelsey's mom, Cheryl Barreth, had not heard from her in some time, all the way back to Thanksgiving, 10 days before. It was something completely out of the ordinary for the young woman, who made it a point to stay in touch with her family members and friends. This morning, a nationwide search is on for missing mother and pilot Kelsey Barrett. She was last seen wearing a white shirt, a gray sweater, uh, blue pants, possibly blue jeans, um, with a brown purse and white shoes. The 29-year-old who has a one-year-old daughter was last seen more than two weeks ago on Thanksgiving Day. Over the weekend, neighbors and friends gathered for a vigil, praying for Kelsey's safe return. Please keep the family of Kelsey Barrett in your heart and soul. Holding out hope that Kelsey will be found. Police found no one at home and the neighbors hadn't noticed her coming and going over the preceding days. Her boyfriend, Patrick Frazy, had said that he hadn't seen Kelsey since they met to exchange their daughter, who was currently staying with him. He did say that the two had talked and texted during that time, but that he hadn't heard anything at all in the last couple of days. A check with her employer provided them with the information that she had texted them a few days before that she would need to take a week off because her grandmother wasn't well and Kelsey would need to travel back to Washington State. Management at the company say they approved the time off but hadn't heard from her since. Cheryl, however, quickly let them know that there was no emergency with Kelsey's grandmother and a check with the family there showed that the young woman had never arrived, nor had they been expecting her. No one seemed to know where she was, and no one could say when she had left for sure. Local police and the Teller County Sheriff's Office immediately began the process of searching for a missing person. Right away, a search warrant was issued to Verizon to access the records of Kelsey's cell phone. First, they found 19 communications between her phone and that of Patrick Frazy, corroborating his story that they had talked at first and then texted during the intervening week. He told investigators that she had responded to his last texts as having gone out for a run and that she was going to jump in the shower. The text from Kelsey's phone ended after that. There were no other calls or texts from her phone after that, but the last electronic signal from the phone was a single ping detected on a cell tower in rural Gooding, Idaho. That ping was over 800 miles away and a long 12 and a half hour drive, and it was nowhere near anyone or anything Kelsey had a connection with. Just one ping so far away. What was the connection? 
The answer was on the other end of Kelsey's phone records that investigators found as they searched through Patrick Frazee's records. There, among all of his regular day-to-day -day communications was a single phone number in Gooding, Idaho. It was literally the needle in the haystack they had been searching for. Investigators called the number and connected with 31-year-old Crystal Lee Kenny, a nurse and former rodeo beauty queen. At first, Kenny said that she didn't know Kelsey or Patrick, but she quickly changed her story. When she began to speak, everything about the horrific story came tumbling out. She began by telling them that she had to tell the truth, that she didn't want Kelsey's family to be left wondering what had happened to their daughter. She said that Patrick had killed Kelsey, and she herself hadn't driven to clean up the mess left behind in Kelsey's apartment after the young woman had been murdered. She admitted that she had then carried Kelsey's telephone, purse, and ID back to Idaho, where the items were then burned on Crystal's property. Crystal had met Patrick years before when she had come to Colorado to look at some horses he had for sale. Patrick, who trained cattle dogs and did farrier work shoeing horses and trimming their hooves, had a lot in common with the former rodeo queen, and they began a long-distance romance, but it was one that had faded with time. Crystal had married and started a family of her own, but the two kept in touch. Patrick told her many times about Kelsey, but had said that she was abusive to him and his daughter. Crystal continued and said over the intervening year, he had told her that things were going terribly in the relationship. And finally, he asked her to help him by killing Kelsey. Still devoted to Patrick, Crystal said they had concocted a plan where they would poison the young mom. A trained nurse, Crystal said that she could give her a lethal combination of Valium and Ambien, and Kelsey would just drift off to sleep and never wake up. Crazily, Crystal actually agreed to drive to Woodland Park and to do just that. She told investigators from the local police, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, and special agents with the FBI that one morning she ordered a large vanilla mocha drink from Starbucks and took it to Kelsey's home. The drink, Patrick told her, was Kelsey's all-time favorite and she would find it irresistible, thereby ensuring that she would drink the lethal cocktail. Crystal knocked on the door, and when Kelsey answered it, she immediately introduced herself as a new neighbor from down the street. She then said that she thanked Kelsey for helping her get her dogs back a couple of days before. When Kelsey said that wasn't her, Crystal just played it off as no big deal and offered her the drink as an attempt to meet a new neighbor. Kelsey thanked her, and Crystal quickly left. She told police that it didn't matter whether or not Kelsey had drunk the coffee because she couldn't go through with putting the drugs in it. It was just coffee and in no way dangerous. Patrick apparently figured that Kelsey had not fallen for the plan simply by not drinking the drink. He provided Crystal with a metal pipe next and told her to lay in wait near the side entrance to the townhome and then just crack her on the head with it. Once again, Crystal couldn't bring herself to do it. He then provided her with an aluminum baseball bat and ordered her to ambush her again. After the third attempt did not go through, Patrick sent her back home. On Thanksgiving night, he would call Crystal and tell her, it's done, you've got something to clean up. He told her he would provide a key to Kelsey's place and that she would go in and clean it thoroughly, getting rid of any evidence. He also told her, she said, how he had killed her. He said they had met up to share a small Thanksgiving meal at Kelsey's place. Security footage from earlier in the day would show Kelsey at a local Safeway grocery store with Kaylee in a baby car seat. They were shopping for the ingredients for a sweet potato casserole. Further, security camera footage from her next-door neighbor's home would show Kelsey, Casey, and Patrick entering the home as a group, with nothing looking out of place. Patrick said that while she was getting ready, he had challenged Kelsey to a little game that he had devised. He told her that he had bought three scented candles and wanted to know if she could pick out what their scents were without reading the labels. She would have to wear a blindfold to do it, though. A makeshift blindfold was fashioned out of one of her sweaters, and Patrick lit the first candle. As she leaned over to get the scent of it, he brutally hit her over the head with a baseball bat. He then continued to beat her. He told Crystal that at one point, Kelsey had uttered her last words, begging him to stop. He didn't. After hearing the horrible story, Crystal could have said no right there and turned him in, 
but she didn't. She'd tell investigators that she was not just in love with Patrick, but also terrified of him as well. She told Patrick she couldn't come immediately because of the holiday, but within a couple of days, she was back in Colorado with a car full of cleaning equipment and a grim and bloody task on her hands. Going into the townhome was like walking into a horror show. Blood and gore were everywhere. The signs of struggle were apparent. The only thing missing was Kelsey's body. Patrick had taken it from the scene already. With determination, she set about cleaning the place. She would later be taken back to the townhome by the investigators to show them just what she had seen and cleaned. Investigators provided Crystal with a cap and a jacket to conceal her identity going into the house. This video was taken by investigators as she took them through the home. She begins in the living room area. We begin on the 21st of December 2018. Um, we're inside Kelsey's apartment with Crystal. Um, her attorney's with us. What did you see? Blood all over the floor. I saw blood up the wall. I saw blood on the roof wall. She continues on, showing investigators where she purposefully left some small blood spatters so they could be found as evidence. Can you show me where you left those? But it was maybe right there. I know it was down low and then I left one up high. Crystal then takes them to the bedroom area and to the bathroom, further explaining how large the crime scene was within the home. Did you touch or manipulate anything in here while you were in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, put laundry detergent in the washing machine and towels in there. Um, I had been instructed to try to wash things, really? and I didn't didn't do that. You put a towel? I could, there might have been a couple of towels that I put inside the washing machine, but they were just towels from dirty laundry. They weren't. They didn't have anything on them that I was aware of. Do you remember what color they were? Red. And and there, so there may have been um, bloody footprints in here, but I don't specifically remember. I wiped um, the toilet, the top of the toilet. Um, I turned on the uh, shower, just in case there was stuff in the bottom. I didn't see anything in the bottom of the shower. Hard. They returned to the kitchen area, and she details more of the cleaning that she did and didn't do. There was blood on top of the coffee maker. There was blood. Um, in fact, I had to climb up near the blood batter up high. How'd you climb up? I had to climb up right here. And so any of the, anything that was in the thing, I don't know. Um, I don't remember exactly, but. I had put it in the thing. She continues, discussing how much blood there was in the place and where she may have missed cleaning. It was great, but to get the curtains off, I had to climb up and undo, and it, um, it, uh, um, it, it was straight. And after I got done with it, it wasn't straight anymore. Okay. The ferocity of the attack becomes apparent as she points out just how high on the walls that she found Kelsey's blood. The spray was uh, from here all the way. Uh, I had to clean up underneath here, then it was all down here. And uh, I, don't, I know that I didn't get um, there. Crystal went on to take them upstairs to show them where there had been bloody footprints left and then told them that Patrick had told her to be on the lookout for a tooth that Kelsey had lost during the beating. Where the tooth was? Mm -hmm. Crystal described the gruesome scene and forensic teams would scour the home, collecting even more evidence, proving her tale to be true of at least what she had walked into. But could they trust her that Patrick had been the killer? Crystal told them that after cleaning up the evidence as best she could, she put clothes, baby toys, books, and even Kelsey's blood-covered Bible into trash bags and headed out to Patrick's ranch. There, she would meet him, and they would destroy the evidence. But where was Kelsey's body? Investigators asked. Crystal said that the man had loaded it into a big plastic tote and put it in the bed of his truck and drove away from the house on Thanksgiving evening. 
scouring every security camera in the immediate vicinity, investigators would eventually turn up images of Patrick and his red truck. At 12.44 p.m., the truck passes by a local business, Williams Log Cabin Furniture, headed toward Kelsey's home. The large black tote box can be seen in the bed of the truck. He was also photographed at an ATM machine that day, and the black plastic tote was clearly visible in the drive-away picture. He is later seen at a gas station with the tote filling up a gas can. The tote is visible again. A search warrant was then served to allow police to search the ranch where Patrick lived with his mother. Crystal accompanied the investigators and pointed out where he had put the black tote box and where the two had made a burn pit to dispose of the evidence and Kelsey's body. Crystal explained that the pair had built a fire and tossed in what she had brought, the clothes, the toys, the Bible, and the grisly remains he had taken as well. As they checked the barn at the farm, cadaver dogs alerted investigators that they had picked up a scent from an area with hay bales. A discolored area matching the size and shape of the black tote box was found, and Crystal confirmed that that was where Kelsey's body had been kept before they burned it. A number of similar black totes were found around the farm used for a number of everyday uses as well. There was no longer a doubt in the minds of the investigators that they had their murderer, even without finding Kelsey's body. The eyewitness account of the burning of the body plus the blood evidence at the crime scene left no doubt that Kelsey had been slain. Patrick Frazee was arrested. Local law enforcement, along with the district attorney and representatives of the Colorado Bureau of Investigations and the FBI, held a press conference to announce the arrest. Today we arrested Patrick Frazee on charges of first-degree murder of Kelsey Barrett, and he is currently being held in the Teller County Jail. As a reminder, Patrick Frazee is presumed innocent until proven guilty. Police Chief Miles DeYoung said that little Kaylee had been placed in protective custody and would be reunited with Kelsey's family. He asked the press to heed the family's request for no interviews during this difficult time. He then continued describing the situation at hand. This has been a methodical and time-consuming multi-state operation with investigators working nearly around the clock to find Kelsey. As you can tell from the arrest, sadly, we do not believe Kelsey is still alive. He told the crowd that even though the arrest had been made, there was still much work to do and it was underway in continuing their investigation. We have also conducted multiple searches at Kelsey's home and other locations as part of this comprehensive investigation. I can tell you we understand you demand a full accounting of why this has happened and nothing is more important to all of us than determining the circumstances surrounding Kelsey's murder and bringing Kelsey and her family justice. District Attorney Dan May spoke next. Patrick Frazee was charged uh, this, uh, this morning with first-degree murder and solicitation for first-degree murder. Uh, that is what he was booked in on. Uh, those who may be familiar with the process, uh, formal charges will be filed in the days ahead. FBI Special Agent Mike Nordwell spoke to the FBI's involvement in the case. Over the past three weeks, the FBI's provided our evidence response team expertise from our behavioral analysis unit, technical analysis, and investigative resources from multiple field divisions across several states. As the press began asking questions, Chief DeYoung retook the podium and answered them as best he could in light of the ongoing investigation. We're still working on that charge um, that has been, uh, that has reached a point where we are able to charge that point, but I'm not able to comment on that because of multiple things that are going on related to that charge. If there are additional arrests related to a solicitation charge, that's an absolute possibility, but I'm not going to um, guess on that at this point. Crystal Kenny's involvement in the case becomes apparent in his explanation. The district attorney would then touch on the fact that Patrick was also being charged with solicitation for enlisting her help in the attempted murder and the eventual disposal of evidence and the body. We have a solicitation crime in our code, so it doesn't matter whether it's burglary, robbery, murder, if you're soliciting someone to help out in that crime, 
and you have to take a substantial step towards really completing that. So it isn't just a discussion. You've actually done something that shows the firmness of your actions. You don't necessarily have to complete it uh, to be a uh, to have a solicitation charge, uh, but you have to show firmness of what you intended to do. In the intervening months before Patrick would come to trial, investigators would work hard at trying to answer every possible question. The biggest being the actual proof of Kelsey's remains. While a portion of a tooth was found in the ashes of the burn pit location, forensic teams from the state and and the FBI could only confirm that it was human and had come from a female. There just wasn't enough extractable DNA left to prove that it was Kelsey's. The testimony from Crystal that she had retrieved a tooth from the murder scene at Patrick's request and then finding burnt tooth remains at his ranch would have to do. Patrick apparently was hard at work as well. While being held in jail, he began soliciting for help again murderous help. It seemed to be a pattern for him. Patrick approached another inmate at the Teller County Jail and asked for help. The inmate was known to others as someone who had done some serious time and had been part of a prison gang. The man was only being held for a short time for missing a court date, and Patrick figured the man would go out and possibly kill off some of his loose ends for him possibly even using some of the old prison gang contacts. Using jail commissary receipts and paper towels, Patrick began providing him with a hit list and detailed instructions of what he wanted done. Each time after passing the man one of the sheets of paper, he warned him to read them, memorize them, and then flush them to get rid of the evidence. Unbeknownst to Patrick, the man, who still sported his prison gang facial tattoos, had no intention of carrying out even a single one of the requests. He was trying to straighten out his life and had put his bad days behind him. The man turned the notes over to officers at the jail and told everything to the prosecution team. By the time Patrick made it to court, any pretense that he had not done the crime was almost a foregone conclusion. Crystal Kinney took the stand and provided her own account to the jury, protected now by a plea deal that would have her only face punishment for tampering with evidence. The district attorney said that it was a deal with the devil, but one that had to be done to get her full cooperation. Other friends and family members, experts, and investigators also testified in the trial. A story of Patrick was put together that showed him to be an abusive, controlling person who attempted to manipulate everyone around him. Testimonies from Kelsey's friends and family members independently described a deteriorating relationship and one in which he was trying to gain full custody of the child one way or the other. Patrick's own brother, Sean Frazee, a policeman from Colorado Springs, even told the jury that he had been at the ranch on Thanksgiving for a family celebration on the day of the event. The meal started at 2.30, but Patrick didn't show up and never called to say he would be late. He didn't come through the door until nearly 5 p.m. and never offered any explanation for missing Thanksgiving dinner. No one there, though, could have known what horrific things Patrick had been doing that day in instead. In the end, after pleading not guilty, Patrick would not take the stand in his own defense, declaring that he would remain silent. The defense attorneys called no witnesses of their own, and their defense of his actions was only to say that Patrick was guilty of saying stupid things and that Crystal Kinney had made up the entire timeline of the killing. The defense's reasoning fell on unsympathetic ears. The jury only had to deliberate the case for three and a half hours before returning a verdict of guilty on all counts versus Patrick Frazee. In the end, he would be sentenced to life without parole plus 156 years. He would appeal the decision two years later, but in January of 2023, the appeal was denied. Crystal Kinney would be sentenced to three years in prison. She, through her attorneys, would later appeal that sentence as being beyond the maximum penalty for the crime that she had agreed to admit to in her plea bargain. An appeals court found that she had been missentenced and reduced it to 18 months. She was released for the time served after the appeal case was won. Little Kaylee is now being raised by Kelsey's family and probably will never have any actual memories of her mother. It is a sad ending to a tragic story, even if the guilty parties were punished for their deeds. Justice never heals all wounds. We can only hope that time will. 
If you found this case compelling, don't forget to like the video, comment down below your take on it, and please subscribe to the channel. Also, hit the notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.